Good afternoon, folks. It's Dave Burrows. I'm Chief Strategist at Barometer Capital Management. I want to welcome you to our weekly webcast. Uh, we've been doing this on Tuesdays and originally, I guess, on Wednesdays since the pandemic began. Uh, and we've really tried to stay on top of what's going on market-wise, sort of where the leadership is and keep portfolios focused in some of the, some of the good spots. Um, as always, uh, always happy to answer questions on this call. So if you want to type in some of your questions into the answer, into the, into the question box, we'll address them at the end. And what I'd like to do is just sort of take a sort of high level overview as to what's going on market wise uh, and what, what may or may not be changing. <clears throat> We're here just after Labor Day. Uh, I know in my household, it's always a new year when the school year starts. All three of my girls are at university and happy to be back in full-time classes. Uh, for a lot of folks, it's the beginning of the holidays. Rosh Hashanah uh, and leading up to, to Yom Kippur. Uh, and that has implications in the market. And, and lots of people have, have uh, memories of echoes of various falls we've been through where it's been difficult. So we're gonna kind of take a look at the internals in the market to see how things are holding up, to see if there is change taking place and see what that means sort of for all of our portfolios. Um, so just to kick off, um, uh, as I always like to do, just from a very high level, <clears throat> sound like a bit of a broken record. We think we started a new structural bull market in equities in 2013. Uh, we have been sort of four steps forward and one step back ever since, much like we were all the way through the 1980s and 90s, and much like equity markets were between 1951 and 66. Uh, these things go on for a long time. Uh, they try like heck to buck you off. Uh, and there will be all kinds of folks who tell you why it is that it's been going on too long. But, you know, these things can go on 15 or 18 years. We're really only about eight years in. <clears throat> and while there certainly are regular corrections, uh, there are some long runs where there's not much volatility. And you really want to try and take advantage of those. From an income perspective, we think that we have transitioned from a falling rate environment, this is the yield on the long-term US Treasury bond over time, uh, to a period where we may be in a more reflationary environment, maybe a period where we see rates slowly work their way higher. We clearly got to a crescendo in the disinflationary theme as we went into COVID uh, and yields hit 50 basis points on the US 10-year bond. And around the world, I think we got to just about $20 trillion worth of negative yielding bonds as people sort of were seeking safety and security. Um, just to be clear, what works during falling rates is quite different than what works during rising rates. And yes, uh, risk assets can do very, very well during a rising rate environment if it's being supported by growth and an expanding economy. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then last, across the asset classes, but not least, we think we have been going through a structural bottoming in commodity prices uh, in absolute terms and certainly relative to other asset classes. Uh, it's been one of the strongest performing groups, basic materials, since the market bottomed last March. Uh, and it has implications for our Canadian marketplace. It has implications for some very small parts of the U.S. market that are not well understood or well owned uh, that have been many years in a bear market. Uh, and, and that has implications as well. So just to start, as we always do from a high level, uh, this is a chart of the S&P. Um, and um, uh, certainly it's been working its way higher in a channel uh, now since October of last year. And we have pretty consistently bounced off the 50 day moving average every time we've come down and tested it. Uh, we're above the 50 day, we're above the 200 day, the, the sorry, the, uh, the 150 day, we're above the 21 day moving average and the eight day moving average, pretty good trend in place. Uh, and certainly we made a new all time high last week. When we look at the NASDAQ 100, NASDAQ 100 has been doing the same thing. It consolidated sort of from the middle of February through June when a lot of the large cap stocks like Amazon and Apple went quite some time without making a new high, but they re-accelerated. And, and again, we're sort of in the middle of this channel. We made a new all-time high today, in fact, uh, and certainly that, that group has been doing quite well. Um, so I am getting sort of inundated by phone calls. People are thinking about their portfolios. They do recognize the market has been pretty good for, for the last year. Um, I think that we continue to get questions on whether 
you know, a, a new wave and Delta, Delta variant or some other variant could derail things. Last Thursday's job reports, while wages were strong, the actual jobs creation was weak, particularly in the hospitality sector, which was the sector that has been fueling a lot of the rebound in employment. There's no uh, lack of questions around the seasonality. September, October are months that people can remember being quite difficult. And as I've mentioned, it's often because analyst estimates start to get ratcheted down because maybe they've been too aggressive. It doesn't seem to be the case this year. There's certainly no end to supply chain disruptions. When I talk to clients and friends who have businesses, they all are talking about the fact they're having difficulty getting raw materials and product to, to turn around and, and to sell to their end clients. And, and last but not least, you know, we've had seven straight months of markets moving higher. And so the question is, how long can this go on for? And, and what I always like to do is to default to the tools that we've used for a long time to understand the health of the market, the internal health of the market. You can always guess at when things might change in the future. I think that's a bit of a mugs game, especially in a bull market, where the hardest thing to do is to stay in your winning positions. But I think that it's really important to try and understand when some of the weaklings in the market start to deteriorate, because that can ultimately wash through into the stronger stocks, which we're all busy staring at. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about that today. And I'm going to start right off the bat with our gauges of internal market health. And the most basic tool that we use is we use a breadth model that tracks the percent of stocks within a particular universe where, where prices are working their way higher. The percentage of stocks that are in long-term uptrends. And we define that using a point and figure price chart. Uh, and it's very quantitative in nature. There's no opinions necessary. I want to know if over time more and more stocks are participating in the rally. That's healthy. There's no bear market ever took place while that was the case. Or if on the other hand, we're seeing internal deterioration. And so we do this weekly because I want to be completely transparent about it. When we see deterioration in breadth, we tend to get more cautious. We raise a little bit of cash. We tighten up the stop losses that we use to make sure that little mistakes don't turn into big mistakes. And at the baseline level, breadth for equities globally is just slowly expanding. In the NYSE, <clears throat> about 60% of stocks are in uptrends. That's been moving higher over the last few weeks. And that's healthy because one of the questions we get is, is this market rally solely being driven by Apple and Google and so on? Globally, breadth is sitting at around 50%. And that has also been expanding over the last three weeks after taking a breather earlier in the summer. And then beyond that, we track the percent of stocks trading above their 50-day moving averages, which is sort of the first line of defense. And that has been moving smartly higher over the last few weeks, uh, both in the US and in Canada and globally. Importantly, we want to look at the percentage of stocks that have positive weekly price momentum or upward trajectory. Often we see stocks pause and go sideways for a period of weeks or months. And we've talked a little bit about that over the last few weeks. We've seen lots of that. But we have seen a reacceleration in the number of stocks with positive momentum. We track the number of stocks making new highs versus making new lows. And that is stubbornly high. Very few stocks making new lows, lots of stocks making new highs. That's healthy. And then the percent of stock trading above their long term moving average is 150 day moving average, which is a very long term measure of, of trend. And that is also moving higher. So, things that I think are relevant this week. When we look within the NYSE, um, we're tracking here the percent of stocks with positive weekly price momentum. When the number is falling, we mark it out in zeros. When it's rising, we mark it out in Xs. So in the seventh month, July, we got to a point where only 24% of stocks in the NYSE were trending higher or had upward trajectory. And then it started to improve. And since the beginning of August, we've moved from 24% of stocks with positive weekly price momentum to now 62%, which is the best level that we've seen since December of last year. 
when we really were in a bull, bull trend. So I think that that is very important to see as we head into fall, because the more of these indicators that are positive and showing improvement, the more of a shock absorber the market has when we get those inevitable pieces of bad news. I've always found that when these indicators are deteriorating, any news that comes is seen as bad news. And as Diana on the trading desk has been saying over the past couple of weeks, we're in a world where any news is good news. So the percentage of stocks with positive momentum improving. Same picture for the NASDAQ. In the month of July, we hit 26%. So below this magic 30% line tends to be sold out. And while stocks had lost their momentum, we know the percentage of stocks in uptrends was fairly uh, consistent. In other words, we weren't seeing breakdowns, we were seeing a pause. And since then, we've seen the percentage of stocks with positive weekly momentum move from 26% to 62%. And it expanded again on Friday. So the market internals appear to be pretty healthy. And when we look beyond just the US, large caps, we can see the same thing for mid-sized companies, which also took a pause. Percentage of stocks and uptrends weakened from May through June and July until by the end of July, only 40% of mid-sized companies in the S&P were in uptrends and that has reversed. And we sit today at just over 60%. For small cap stocks, we got to a point where only 42% of companies were in uptrends and that reversed in July, and here we are at 54%. So not just very large cap, not just mid cap, but also small cap stocks. So we look at geographic regions, of course, we look at sectors, we look at market caps, and what I'm seeing across the board is improvement in breadth almost any way you cut it. Now let's look at the sector from a sector perspective. On the 20th of August, this was the distribution curve for the group of sectors that we basket stocks into to track how various parts of the market are doing. If they show up on this chart in small letters, it means that breadth in that sector has been deteriorated, meaning fewer and fewer stocks and uptrends. And I can tell you, I think it did a rough count before the call, something like 28 of these sectors were in deterioration on the 20th of August. As we sit here today, you can see almost all of them are in large caps, which means the percentage of stocks and uptrends has started to expand again. Now, this is a distribution curve. So at this end of the spectrum, you have sectors with a very small percentage of stocks doing well. The other end of the spectrum, we have, you know, in this column, anything that's here has between 68, 72% of stocks all in uptrends. Savings and loans, which are regional banks, fit into that category. And you can see there's all kinds of sectors showing expanding breadth. And these ones in red are ones that just changed as of Friday. So I think as of today, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, like 10, 11 sectors of 40 some odd are showing deteriorating breadth. So at the sector level, we're seeing improving breadth. Let's look geographically. So any of the sector, sorry, geographic regions in green are showing expansion in breadth. So we look at a lot of individual markets, but let's just bucket them. All Asia Pacific, that is showing expanding breadth. All Latin America, showing expanding breadth. All Middle East, showing expanding breadth. All Europe, showing expanding breadth. All US, showing expanding breadth. So geographically, we're seeing expanding breadth. So I know there's lots of things to worry about, but breadth at the sector level, at the geographic level, at the market cap level for equities is expanding everywhere. It's a great setup to be coming into fall when we know lots of people are concerned about what might happen. Let's take a quick run through the leadership themes. Uh, I don't wanna to spend too, too much time on anything because there's lots to cover, but let's start with the obvious. Technology continues to work its way higher and today, again, trade it at a new high. Now, within technology, there's lots of different groups and themes that we want to focus in. Um, let's see, uh, semiconductors. Semiconductors are probably the most important group. It's the most ba important basic building block of the modern economy, especially as things continue to digitize. We're hearing a lot about the metaverse 
and that is our digital transformation to a digital life that we're all living in. It's fueled by semiconductors. Well, semiconductor index this week made a new all-time high after having consolidated from February through all the way into the middle of July. Very healthy, took a little bit of the excess optimism out. We broke out, pulled back, and are on making new highs. We've talked about this group over the last little while. Certainly NVIDIA is the granddaddy in the group. And, uh, and that's one that we have a good sized position in and have had for some time. Their, their chips are the leaders for GPUs, for artificial intelligence, uh, for uh, used in, in crypto mining, certainly used for graphics acceleration uh, and continues to perform really well. We also have a good sized position in the SciTime Corp, which makes timing chips, uh, things that are used in, in devices that will be included in the Internet of Things. But this group continues to do well. Advanced micro devices also looks quite good. Uh, when I take a look at artificial intelligence and robotics within technology, Certainly, it's had a great reacceleration out of this consolidation that we highlighted over the last little while. And when we look within that group, there's all kinds of companies that we could look at. Tesla is an obvious one that people talk about being a user of artificial intelligence. Cadence Design Systems is a software company that we are invested in that does electronic design automation. Uh, and made a new high this week, steadily rising relative strength versus the market. Uh, cybersecurity uh, continues to perform well. It's had a great acceleration over the last few weeks as tech started to lift. Uh, Palo Alto Networks is one of our favorite positions in this group, made a new relative strength high versus the S&P in the last week. Now, there's the obvious ones, Apple. Apple today announced their next, <clears throat> next launch date, which I think is September the 14th for new iPhones, like a bunch of other products as well. Market seemed to like that after consolidating really from the beginning of the year through until July, and now starting to move higher into a new bull trend. Google really didn't quit at any point, certainly there for a number of different major technologies and Facebook, certainly probably the leader for this new move into the metaverse. Within the leadership themes, one of the things we've been focusing on is things that do well when bonds are not doing so well. And we want to continue to test this theory. Is this something that continues to play out? So this is the price chart of the TLT, which is the long-term U.S. government ETF, bond ETF. And the bonds made a spike high in March of last year at the beginning of the pandemic. And since then, have been making steadily lower highs. Now, after we'd had a a, a, a sort of a crescendo in this first move down in bond prices, you know, things kind of got overdone and we corrected. In fact, we corrected about one third or 38% of the move. And at that point ran out of gas and each attempt to make a new high, a higher high has failed. And here we are again, working our way lower. So let's test and see if the reflationary themes, the things that do well during rising rates, that are probably under-owned in general, you know, are performing well. Well, one of the things that we know is that when we're in a reflationary environment, global stocks tend to do quite well. We spent some time last summer and last fall talking about the fact there were a whole bunch of global stock markets that while the U.S. has been rallying since 2013, have been on pause. And in fact, many of them had years and years since the most recent new high. And India was one of the first to break out. India this past couple of weeks have really re-accelerated to the upside. Uh, I think that's very positive. Uh, Taiwan, which had been in a bear market since 2000, finally broke out in July of last year, then consolidated after its first good move. Again, made it first its first new high uh, in the last 130 days, uh, just sort of as those bonds were rolling over. The Frontier Markets ETF is a similar picture. We broke out, we retested, and moving higher. So global stocks acting quite well, uh, and, and that's for whole markets. Certainly, there's some big leaders within these groups. A couple of our favorites, Singapore-based C Corporation, C Limited. Uh, C Limited is an internet platform that 
that uh, markets uh, entertainment, e-commerce, uh, digital financial services. It's growing at a very rapid pace uh, and you know, continues to act well, made a new relative strength high this week. Uh, and um, Mercado Libra, which is a South American uh, e-retailer <clears throat> and provider of technology tools, uh, again, also made a new relative strength high. So these are a couple that we focused on as rifle shot opportunities. And then we also, of course, in our macro portfolio, hold those ETFs for Taiwan, for India, and so on, <clears throat> to just get exposure at the geographic level. Uh, and there's the Mexico ETF. Again, many years of sideways broke out and made a new high in the past week. Let's talk about commodities a little bit. Commodities broke this very long-term trend that had been in place actually since 2008, so 13 years, and certainly consolidated. But again, in the past week, we made a new high. And within that group, they're not all acting the same. Certainly different basic materials are performing well at different times. One of the groups we talked about last week was uranium and the uranium stocks, producers, which had consolidated after a first move up down to the 200 day moving average and was reversing up. Look at the follow through this week. Just an enormous move higher for this group with companies led by Cameco, for instance, Next Gen Energy, there's several others. Uh, the spot price for uranium moving smartly higher. Uh, many of these sectors are sectors where new capacity has not been put on in a long time. Uh, and they're not well owned and they're relatively small parts of the market. And if they're just coming out of multi-year bear markets, there could be a long way to go. Lithium continues to act very, very well and the companies supplying into the new battery technologies. And agriculture, again, this past week puts in a new high. So lots of, lots of strength kind of in the basic materials in our area. Let's talk about reflation and financial services. So some of the banks over the last two or three weeks have had a consolidation. The best performing part of the financials group have been the broker dealers and asset managers. We talked over the last few weeks about companies like CI Financial and IGM, uh, investors, uh, uh, a group that owns McKenzie Financial. It continued to make a new high this week, but certainly other, other companies in the financial group, Blackstone in private equity acting very, very well. Morgan Stanley, which is a, a name we've talked a lot about, made new all-time highs. <clears throat> and SIVB, uh, which is Silicon Valley Bank Corp, one of the fastest growing US banks uh, after consolidating, looks like it's trying to reaccelerate the relative strength picking up again versus the S&P. So there's all kinds of stuff working here in our Canadian universe in financial services point of sale Lightspeed is providing a platform of technology tools to bricks and mortar retailers, not just payments, uh, but allowing them to manage their inventory and workflow and staffing uh, made, made great strides over the last couple of weeks since we talked about that as one of our sort of top picks. Uh, in the transports, again, a reflationary sector, TFI International continues to act very well. <clears throat> and in the infrastructure and construction space, Canadian Acon Group, uh, had, a, had a wonderful week and actually a very good day today, uh, moving higher. So without getting too long in the tooth, those companies that have shown leadership and those sectors that have shown leadership that are included in this MTUM ETF are reaccelerating and making new highs. So we have leadership groups continuing to prove themselves out. We have an expanding list of sectors that are participating in the rally. We have an expanding set of markets globally, uh, geographic regions that are showing expansion. Uh, we have uh, uh, additional market caps beyond large cap. We've got mid caps and small caps performing quite well. We worry every day about leadership and we worry every day about risk of price correction, prices coming down. Time consolidations are are given, they're gonna happen. But it looks to me as though we have a pretty healthy market. Now, at Barometer, our job isn't to own everything. Our job isn't to replicate an index. You can all go buy that <clears throat> by buying an ETF. We're active managers. And we use these breadth-based tools to try and focus the portfolios in areas of the market that are relevant, right? We don't need to be everywhere. We wanna own the groups that have net new money getting put to work where we have a tailwind. Sometimes those tailwinds go on for a long time. Sometimes they don't last long. In a bull market like the one we're in, 
they tend to be quite resilient. We watch every day for new leadership, which at this point doesn't appear to be uh, coming about. We've got leadership in technology and large cap growth stocks, but we've also got leadership in economically sensitive cyclicals that benefit from a new economic cycle. Notably, the defensive sectors, things like consumer staples uh, and utilities uh, and telcos are the sectors that do well during falling rates. They don't appear to be landing in any of the top tier sectors at this point. So we're avoiding those groups. If we see deterioration and we worry about it always at this time of year, we would be very quick to get defensive. But as it is right now, the portfolios are fairly focused. Financials continue to be a very large part of our world. Technology, while it's less than market weight, is a very significant weight within our portfolios across a broad range of technology areas. Industrials is a good sized overweight. Um, and when we work down the list, materials are a good size overweight, staples are about uh, market weight, utilities are a little below, a little, sorry, down from the last couple of weeks, uh, and energy continues to be a small weight, discretionary is a small weight, and healthcare is a small weight. So we look very little like the index, uh, and we will be very quick to use our stop losses should things get more difficult. But as it stands right now, we are in the face of the greatest um, liquidity event in markets over the last number of years. Financial conditions are as easy as they have been in my memory. And there's the old saying, don't fight the Fed. So <clears throat> we, we man these processes every day. The investment team has been very, very busy making sure that we're staying on top of our positions and looking at new opportunities. Uh, but as it stands right now, the portfolios are kind of steady as she goes. Uh, but we will get defensive if things get sloppy from here. So with that, if there's any questions, maybe we can answer them. <clears throat> I, see, I see a question uh, from a client about energy. Uh, and the energy weighting is quite a low weight right now. And, and we hadn't mentioned it um, uh, this week. Um, it's the energy sector improved somewhat over the last two weeks, but continues to be a broken trend. Uh, it was the last sector within the basic materials sector to break its multi-year bear market. And it was the first one to roll over and take a punch in the forehead when basic materials were correcting in summer. So <clears throat> we, we like some very specific companies that are behaving much better than the sector, like Canadian Natural Resources, as an example, tourmaline in the, in the, in the gas. Um, but we do have a relatively low weight because it is augmented by some clean energy sectors uh, that I think maybe are giving us a little bit better opportunity. So we look for some sort of reacceleration. It's a difficult sector to be in often in the month of September and October. Uh, so we aren't giving it much benefit of the doubt. Uh, there are lots of great performing sectors that I think are giving us more at this point. Um, next question comes from another client asking, does the chip shortage con concern us in the automotive sector, specifically for Magna? Uh, and any thoughts on the Russell 2000? The chip shortage is an issue and it is an issue for the, for the sector. So if we take um, the CARS ETF, you can see relative strength for the global auto ETF uh, has, has waned. Now it's stabilized over the last couple of weeks, that's a positive, but we have seen stocks like Magna pull back. Um, here's the Magna chart. Now, this kind of pullback is not a, not a, a, a broken chart, but certainly it's one that we wanna keep an eye on. Uh, when I look at the drive ETF, which includes some of the automation, uh, uh, autonomous driving parts of the market, again, it's been consolidating really since January. And this is the group that would be most impacted by chip shortage. Um, you know, certainly something to keep an eye on. The reality is, though, that the chip shortage will resolve itself, some companies quicker than others. 
Um, we do have good exposure to semiconductors themselves because there is pent up demand. And we do think that there's pent up demand in the auto, in the auto sector for the, for the consumer. So certainly one worth watching. But again, when stocks or sectors go sideways uh, for a period of time, that's often a healthy thing. Uh, I don't think that the demand for those automobiles is going away. Now, I don't see any other questions. So if there aren't any more questions, um, uh, let's, uh, let's just kind of move forward. Um, it's uh, the 7th of September. I know that because it's my daughter's birthday tomorrow, the 8th of September, and I can't forget that. Um, we'll look forward to coming back next week. Look, um, you know, we, we often hear um, at the beginning of September, you know, keep, keep an eye on risks, and we, we do that every day. Uh, but at the same time, you don't get a bull market very often. You have to take advantage of it when it's here. Uh, and so as long as these leadership themes continue to hang, hang in, as long as the short-term and longer-term breadth models continue to be healthy, I think that the markets have a pretty good shock absorber built in to handle news. And uh, if anything changes, we'll certainly update. I encourage anybody who likes to follow markets to follow us on Twitter at Barometer CA. I try and put up uh, uh, some notes uh, every couple of days on things that are standing out to us. And uh, if you've got any questions uh, for, for, for me or for our investment team, don't hesitate to contact one of our investment counselors or come to me directly, dburrows at barometercapital.ca. And uh, if nothing else, everybody have a great week and we'll look forward to seeing you again next Tuesday at four o'clock. Have a great week.